screen. Um, and I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to keep it brief, but um, who knows? So uh, I just wanna start by kind of talking over what we're gonna go through. Uh, first, does anyone recognize the background? Does anyone recognize what this photo could be? Okay, so this is actually an interior photo of Holy Blossom's Bond Street Temple. So for a long time, we thought we only had the exterior photos, but this is in the interior, including a little organ that might be talked about later. Um, and this is our later temple. So today we're gonna talk about the reform roots uh, in Cincinnati, who founded them, how did they change? We're gonna go on to kind of discuss two important early rabbis of Holy Blossom. One is Rabbi Barnett Brickner and his wife, Rebecca Brickner, and also Rabbi Ferdinand Isserman. And then we're just gonna talk about a few of the lasting influences and then I'm, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. And also, if you have any questions while I'm talking, um, feel free to break in um, or you can write it in the chat either way um because i i'm gonna try to cover a lot and i don't know that i'm gonna make it <laughs> so um first let's start with who was holy blossom from 1856 to 1920. so holy blossom was actually founded as an orthodox congregation and they first employed a shocket or a ritual slaughterer um, because obviously the most important thing before you can pray is to have a full belly, right? So they didn't hire rabbis, they didn't hire cantors, they didn't hire educators. They hired a shocket who also acted as the moil and part-time educator. Um, and eventually they ended up hiring Rabbi Barnett Elias, who led the congregation and he was an ordained Orthodox rabbi. So all of the rabbis between 1890 and 1920 for those 30 years, were Orthodox rabbis. Before the 1890s, they were kind of educated lay people, um, shockets, people that had, that had clout, but maybe didn't have necessarily like a smicha or like a formal ordination. And so after 1920, there came a rabbi named Rabbi Barnett Brickner, who was a young greenhorn from coming from seminary in Cincinnati. And at that point, thanks to his work, the work that had been set before him, and some of the work with Edmund Scheuer, which you'll hear about next week with Sheila, Holy Blossom became a reform seminary. So before that could happen, reform had to exist. So not a lot of us know about the roots of reform and where they actually started. Um, so I'm gonna talk about kind of two of the big figures in the early years, and then also the seminary that has created the uh, rabbinic voice for over 145 years of Reform Judaism. So we're going to start by talking about Isaac Mayer Wise. Um, Isaac Mayer Wise is considered the father of North American Reform Judaism. And this quote comes from his book, Reminiscences, where he writes from his time of immigration from Bohemia to the United States up to the founding of HUC Cincinnati. And I felt this quote sums him up quite good. Either I will build up a Judaism suited to the age and breathing the atmosphere of American freedom, or I will be buried beneath the ruins of old Jerusalem. Isaac Mayer Wise saw himself as an Americanist and a Jew, not necessarily a Jewish American. He wanted to bring Judaism into the thriving world that he saw in this new world that he came to. So Isaac Mayer Wise was born in 1819 and he immigrated to the United States in 1846. Many people have described him as pugnacious, uh, which I think is an excellent term to describe him. He certainly had a lot of ideas and let them be known. He was a bold moderate, a theologian, and a literary artist and reform activist. And I was asked recently uh, where he got ordained. And after doing some digging, it's actually interesting because there's no confirmed ordination of Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, although it's believed that he received uh, smicha from a Prague Beit Dean. 
um, who had several rabbis that oversaw his ordination. Once he had gone through this ordination, he decided to come to America with his wife and young family, and he ended up coming to Albany, New York. There's an interesting story about him being in Albany um, because he made some really outlandish statements. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and tell you a little story um, because oftentimes we think of these characters that founded great institutions as wonderful people. And I just wanna give you a snapshot of the real person. So a few weeks before Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise had gone to Charleston, North Carolina and gave a sermon in which he stated some beliefs uh, that were contrary to his congregation in Albany. When they found out and he came back, they tried everything they could do to fire him. They tried many different things and none of them worked until this happened. Okay. He is trying to hold Rosh Hashanah services, and he describes it this way. At first, I did not wish to put the matter to the test, but my friends insisted that the law must be satisfied. Consequently, I went to the synagogue on New Year's morning, appeared in my official garb, and found one of Spainer's creatures who had been cause of altercation about the Sabbath sitting in the chair. I took another seat. Excitement ruled the hour. Everything was quiet as the grave. Finally, the choir sings, and at the conclusion of the song, I step before the ark to take the scrolls of the law, as usual, and to offer prayer. Spainer steps in my way, and without saying a word, smites me with his fist so that my cap falls from my head. This was the terrible signal for an uproar. The Poles and Hungarians who thought only of me struck out like wild men. The young people jumped down from the choir gallery to protect me and had to fight their way through the surging crowd. Within two minutes, the whole assembly was a struggling mass. The sheriff and his posse who were summoned were forced out until finally the whole assembly surged out of the house onto the street. Louis Spainer, I said to him, there is a law which I can appeal. I have a hundred thousand dollars more than you. I do not fear the law. I will ruin you. I finally reached home bound with pain and inexpress inexpressible grief. So just a little snapshot of what it must have been like to be in that Albany congregation with Rabbi Isaac Mayerwise. Uh, on Rosh Hashanah, he gets in a fight with the board president. As he goes to take out the Torah scrolls, the board president punches him in the face so hard his hat falls off. And then a melee happens between the congregation who was broken in between Isaac Mayer Wise's reforms and the congregation's desire to remain orthodox. I also particularly love the line in, uh, in which he says he has $100,000 more than this other person and isn't afraid to fight him in the law. So just keep in mind, while Isaac Mayer Wise is a venerated character, he is indeed pugnacious, and there are many more stories where that came from. Anyhow, he served as a rabbi at Congregation Bethel in Albany before he was recruited to come to Cincinnati in 1853. Cincinnati of 1853 was actually the largest city uh, west in the United States at the time uh, because we had not expanded. And so it was really a metropolis and a very German Jewish uh, community. While Rabbi Wise was in Cincinnati, he founded Plum Street Temple, which uh, if you've seen Rabbi Goodman giving sermons or anything, Plum Street's actually right behind us. It's where we got married. Um, in 1873, he founded the uh, United Association of Hebrew Congregations, which is now our URJ. In 1874, he founded the first English language Jewish newspaper in the United States the American Israelite newspaper, which runs today. In 1875, he founded Hebrew Union College, the first reform rabbinic seminary in the United States, and now the largest in the world. And in 1889, he founded the CCAR, which we are all still a part of, and Rabbi Splansky, in fact, is part of the board. So he had quite a bit on his plate um, during this time, and in the middle of it, still managed to inspire a generation. So once Isaac Mayer Wise 
had passed on, his legacy continued. And one of the largest, most contentious parts of this legacy comes in something called the Trefa Banquet, um, which led to the Plittsburgh platform, which led to Kaufman Kohler. So I'm gonna go ahead a slide. And I, I'm, I hope you don't mind me reading to you. I just think history speaks better than I ever can. So I'm gonna speak a small excerpt about this dinner. <laughs> yeah, check out, check out the menu. If anyone knows French, I don't, <laughs> but you might be able to discern more than I can. So um, at half past seven in the evening of that same day of ordination, some 200 of the distinguished guests gathered in Cincinnati's famed Highland House for a lavish banquet, as you can see, very lavish, to celebrate the occasion. But no sooner had the invocation been spoken and the waiters begun to serve the food when a commotion stirred in the banquet hall. Two rabbis arose from their seats and left the room. Three other guests indignantly refused to partake in the meal. It was little neck clams on the half shell had been placed before them as the first course of the elaborate menu. Crab, shrimp, and frogs were to follow. The arrangements had been handled by a committee of Cincinnati laymen who hired a caterer and also paid the entire cost of the dinner. Wise himself had not been party to the breach of Kashrut. Indeed, it was politically so preposterous, a faux pas, that he would have never allowed it to happen. But it could have occurred at all simply, the fact that it could have occurred at all simply brought into focus what the afternoon ceremonies had obscured. The supporters of the college represented such a wide spectrum of attitudes to Jewish tradition that the alliance forged over the previous few years were unlikely to remain intact. So as we can see from this menu, if, if at the time they were observing Kashrut, we can see how offensive this would be, right? You have clams, you have crab, you have milk and dairy mixed with meat, you have pigeons, which I don't even want to go into, you know, like, so you have this issue where the lay people of Cincinnati, the students of HUC and the rabbis of the CCAR and UAHC are coming to terms with what their new Judaism means in America. So the Trefa Banquet really represents over one meal, the dividing line between Jewish tradition and Jewish practice. Katie, and, mm -hmm. uh, could, could I ask you a question, please? Sure. Just backing up a little bit. As I understand it from the history of slavery, Cincinnati was, I guess, the first, like one of the first northern cities where um, escaped slaves could uh, gain their freedom. And I'm just wondering about, I asked this question in the chat, so uh, Rabbi Isaac M. Wise, what, do you know what his attitudes were or his fellow Con his congregants were toward uh, slavery and abolition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking that question, Anne. That's a great question. Uh, actually, the Ohio River that sets about five minutes, you know, three blocks away from Plum Street Temple is considered really the furthest line of the Mason-Dixon line. So the Mason-Dixon line was kind of an invisible line between freedom and slavery. So as soon as they could make it over that river from Kentucky, the banks of Kentucky to the banks of Ohio, uh, they were considered free. Obviously, we know, learning our history, that freedom doesn't come just from getting to the other side. There's a lot more things to follow up on that. Um, and also, just a little fun fact before I answer your question, is that the famous novel um, Uncle Tom's Cabin written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, which actually created a large conversation at the time about abolition um, and equal rights, or just rights, um, was actually written five minutes away from Hebrew Union College. So often when students drive to seminary, they're passing by the very home where one of these original abolitionists wrote her novel that inspired a nation to have a conversation. Um, I haven't done any exact digging into Wise's 
or Kaufman Kohler's beliefs in uh, slavery or abolition. There has been some research done on their sermons and how they addressed it. Um, but our colleague, David Bl Rabbi David Bloom, um, did that, but I can't speak uh, knowledgeably about it. Although I'm interested now that you asked, it does make me wonder because they built Plum Street Temple during the end of the Civil War because the union had a large influx of funds. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's- Yeah, a yeah. And, and he arrived, when did you say, in 1853? So slavery was, uh, uh, if I can say this, alive and well, um, you know, in, in the southern states for sure, in some of the northern states too, by the way, in Canada. So um, yeah. it's just something to wonder about. No, it, it's a huge part of my, like, because I'm such a Cincinnatian, it's a huge part of my heritage to know what did these thought leaders think and how did that relate to what we're experiencing now? So I, I wrote that down. I'm actually going to research it. I love that question. Um, Katie, do you mind if I just answer it in 10 seconds really quickly? Yeah, please. Um, so I, and I, I think it's worthwhile and you'll, clearly you'll do a better job of the research and, and, and you can follow back up with Anne. But from what I understand that, uh, all of the institutions that Isaac Mayer Wise created, um, while they inspired Reform Judaism, he was actually a unionist. And so his main goal in America was to bring about a unified American Judaism. And so he never spoke out against <laughs> slavery formally or publicly, because what he was really trying to do was unify many, many sides and many, many people. So we can look back uh, in history and, and judge on that, or we can say, you know, however you want to put it. Um, but we do, we do know that uh, he was more, um, he was much more focused on, on unifying people. And this was a topic of the day that was uh, divisive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, you're Thank doing you. great, Katie, by the way. Thanks, Rabbi Goodman. Um, okay, so after the Trefa banquet um, and, and, and another big contentious, uh, the Pittsburgh platform was called and it was convened by Rabbi Kaufman Kohler. And uh, this document in 1885, which is actually fascinating if you go and read it, especially as a reformed Jew, um, that this is the document in which we define our differences. And one of the things that they pointed out was that they believed that ritual dress and laws of kashrut were created in a time and place far removed from our current reality. So one can only assume that the Trefa banquet, which happened before, relayed to the Pittsburgh platform and the defining of what we believed versus what we were practicing. Kaufman Kohler, who convened it, was also a European Jew, born in Bavaria in 1843. And he came from a, a family of rabbis and he was actually ordained through a German seminary um, before he came over. And he, like I said, convened the uh, Pittsburgh platform. And then he became the first president of HUC after Isaac Mayer Wise. And just quickly, some of the things that he did that remain at HUC today include um, in instituting a daily worship service in the chapel, which we still do, and a Kabbalat Shabbat service. He also removed Hebrew from the curriculum and replaced it with Midrash because he believed that educated American Jews already were bilingual and they didn't need the teaching, but instead they needed to learn about Midrash. Uh, one last little thing about Kaufman Kohler is that he actually was the president when they bought the grounds of what is now Hebrew Union College in 1903 for $30,000. <laughs> I cannot imagine what it would go for now. Um, so one quick snapshot of the students, because now we're going to talk about Rabbi Brickner and Rabbi Isserman, who influenced Holy Blossom. So they were students during this time, 1904 to 1929. During this time at Hebrew Union College, over 70% of the students were Eastern European immigrants, second generation, and almost 30% were first-generation immigrants who had been born in Eastern Europe. Uh, they were young, most of them were still in high school, and their average age was 19. 
This is different than now. Now Hebrew Union College, you have to have a BA and it's a five-year program. Zachary is not <laughs> 19 years old. Um, but so they also were dedicated. So of the students that came in, very young, often between the ages of 13 and 19, uh, only 50% of them were actually ordained after their nine years of education. And at the time, 347 students were attending and only three were married. And by the time they graduated, less than 10% were married. So it was a very young, immigrant, vibrant, dedicated group here, including our very own Rabbi Isserman and Brickman. So this is a little, I, I, I know I'm telling a lot of stories, so I'm gonna skip over this, I think. But um, there's this wonderful book called Telling Tales Out of School that covers uh, different stories about professors and students on the campus from the time of Isaac Mayer Wise all the way up to the 1930s. Our very own rabbis Brickner and Isserman submitted stories. I find this story funny because they each told the same story very differently. <laughs> see, not only can you see in length, um, but hopefully I'll be able to put the PowerPoint on the website, um, but also in the way they told the story. So these two rabbis, who came from their respective backgrounds here to Holy Blossom to shape our reform were very similar people, but also very different in some very meaningful ways. And so our first reform rabbi at Holy Blossom was Rabbi Barnett Brickner, who was born in 1892 in New York, and he earned both a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science from Columbia University um, and, and had a passion for social work. And while he was at HUC, he received his PhD from the University of Cincinnati, which is across the street from the college. Um, and when he came to Toronto, he was already married to his wife, Rebecca. And I found this primary document very personal, I guess, in a way. Um, here, here he is as the new rabbi, newly ordained, newly married. And he writes to the president of the congregation, Toronto Hebrew Congregation, in quotes, Holy Blossom, right? Because it wasn't our official name yet. Enclosed, please find bill of expenses incurred by we in moving my family uh, and belongings from Cincinnati to Toronto, totaling $292. So having just done this last summer, <laughs> I can promise you that the move from Cincinnati to Toronto does not cost $292. Um, but it just, it, it just was a very personal feeling, not only to see his handwriting like we were talking about in the beginning, but also just to see that he was a real person and a real family. And we still communicate with our board presidents this way. So Rabbi Brickner was, was quite a character. Um, he was appointed in 1920 to Holy Blossom. He originally came to just help with the high holidays. And then the people of Toronto, the people of Holy Blossom were so persuasive that they convinced him to stay and become their rabbi. Um, so I want to read, read his exact words. At the end of my first year, the congregation introduced the union prayer book, worship without hats, the mixed pew, celebration of the festivals on one instead of two days, confirmation and late Friday services. So this young man comes from Cincinnati to Toronto and in one year is able to bring in the reform prayer book to remove hats, to help families sit together. And that's not all he did. While he was in Canada in 1921, he was the co-founder of the Canadian Jewish Review and was a contributing editor for four years. From 1922 to 1925, he was the president of the Toronto Federation of Jewish Charities, which as we know is still thriving today. He also founded the Ontario Jewish Agricultural School, which was used to educate new immigrant workers so that they would be able to uh, provide lives for themselves here in the new world. He was also president, as if this wasn't enough, he was also president of the Ontario Social Hygiene Society and he was also on the board of the Jewish Hospital and Jewish Boys Club. One of the most keystone things that he's known for here in the city 
is that he founded the Ontario Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society in 1923. And the important part there is that it brought over 5,000 Russian Jews to Canada from Romania. And he was able to bring those people here. And as you can see, he set up services so that they would be able to earn a life for themselves and educate themselves once they were here. He was incredibly amazing. And in addition to all the work he did within Holy Blossom, bringing in reform, the work he did in the Toronto community, and the work he did in the Canadian community through his writing, um, he also was one of the first people to speak at Protestant pulpits, and he also went out to service clubs in Ontario to spread the word. And so Rabbi Brickner is someone to, to really aspire to, uh, a man who saw reform not only within the congregation, but within the community. And so um, I do want to share another interesting, okay, well, I want to share this quote first, in which he said, my main job, I felt, however, was the organization and systemization of the social and communal activities of an expanding and rapidly adjusting Jewish community in its new Canadian setting. Now, given some of our Holy Blossom members would not say it's a new Canadian setting, they would say our families have been here for 50 plus years, um, but to Brickner, it was new. And you can see that if Isaac Mayer Wise's idea was creating a new Judaism, Brickner's idea was creating the systems in which they could function. And so before I move on to his incredible life, um, I want to share this interesting story. So Rabbi Brickner inspired many people. And interestingly enough, when I was going through his file to research for this class, I found a letter from Rabbi Perry Nussbaum written to Dr. David Eisen. Uh, Dr. David Eisen is a Holy, was a Holy Blossom member and was the original uh, founder of our archives. And this letter was sent to him in 1970, 1972. And he says, it was under Brickner that the first Canadian born Jew enrolled in the Hebrew Union College at Cincinnati. This was Abe Mickey Keenan, whom I know very well from Boy Scout days and who par whose parents belonged to Holy Blossom. Um, Mickey finished his first year at HUC and then unfortunately died during the summer vacation. So I was shocked by that. What could have taken this young man? Was it 1918? Was it something like that? And I was able to do more research through um, Ancestry.com and I believe that I have found the correct person and that that person uh, actually passed away from leukemia, unfortunately. Um, but the turn of events is that unfortunately, because of this loss, the sisterhood at Holy Blossom still had a scholarship fund. Rabbi Brickner was still embracing new students and Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, at the time just Perry Nussbaum, ended up being the first Canadian rabbinical student at HUC and the first, as he describes it, British subject um, ordained at Hebrew Union College. And so even after Brickner had left HUC, even after he was in Toronto, the way that he inspired Toronto Jews even had them being sent back to Cincinnati. Um, so I found that connection really interesting that he was able to, to, uh, to connect that. Um, um, Katie? Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, please. Um, I, I've recently finished writing a historical novel about the Canadian Jewish Farm School, which was led by Morris Sachs out in Georgetown. And I have a wonderful photo of Rabbi Brickner standing with uh, Morris Sachs and a whole group of other distinguished people. Um, you probably have it in the archives, but if you don't, let me know, guys, and I can tell you the source. I think it's in the Ontario Jewish Archives, too. But it's an amazing story how Rabbi Brickner um, and his wife helped found that Canadian Jewish Farm School. And in 1927 and in 1929, they brought over some Polish Jewish orphans from the uh, city of Mesrich and basically 
uh, ended up saving these, these kids' lives because if they'd stayed in Mesrich, they would have perished in the Holocaust. So um, when you say Rabbi Brickner, you know, it gives me a, a stab in the heart, sort of. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. We would love to know the source of that photo. Um, at least I didn't find it when I was researching. I'd love yeah. to see that because what amazing work. And you know, that's the thing is you don't realize how much one person can impact a whole community. Yeah. And now, yeah. yeah. Uh, who should I send it to? Should I send it to Michael or Sheila or you or? Yeah. Any, any one of us. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll find it. Sure. I look forward to reading this book, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's coming out next year. Nice. Thank you. Oh, okay. So thank you. All right. So this is, I mean, this is goals, right? This is rabbits and goals. Um, I, I will never achieve the success that Rabbi or Rabbi Berkner's wife, Rebecca did. Um, but, I, but I certainly aspire to, uh, to put in the hard work and dedication that she did to this community and to the communities that she went to afterwards. Um, so Rebecca Brickner was born two years after Rabbi Brickner in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, she married at the age of 25, which at the time was, you know, a little late, but she had actually been uh, pursuing her education. Um, and she and Rabbi Brickner ended up having two children, including uh, Rabbi Balfour Brickner, who uh, is very popular and substantial in his own right. Um, but I, I just have to share with you some of the incredible things about Rabbi Brickner's wife. So um, not only was she a rabbi's wife, uh, but also she was the first professional female Jewish educator in the United States. So this is the early 1900s. And not only has she pursued degrees, she's also an educator and worked at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City before she came. She was the founder of Hadassah in the United States, and she served on their national board. So when she came to Canada, much like Rabbi Brickner, she saw things as a system. And in 1921, she founded the first Reformed Jewish Sisterhood in Canada here at Holy Blossom Temple. And in the same year, she also founded Hadassah Canada, which is incredible. And I, I'll leave the sisterhood, um, I'll leave the sisterhood history aside because I don't know it as well. But I do know that uh, Rebecca Brickner continued to travel, educate, and do so much for the community before and after she left. And in fact, even knew Rabbi Spolansky's um, mother and uh, had some interactions with them. The connection between Rebecca Brickner and Holy Blossom, though, revolves around this building right here. So as you can see, in 1922, the Hebrew Union College had raised almost $150,000 for their dormitory on their Cincinnati campus. At this point, I was able to find records that show that after the establishment of the Holy Blossom Sisterhood in 1921, there were funds sent from Toronto to Cincinnati from the Sisterhood. And since this is a project from the National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods, one can assume that that money went to this dorm room. So you can see here how the mothers of Israel care for the sons of Torah. And it ends up that this building did get built in the 1920s, thanks to the National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods, including our very own at Holy Blossom, and that this building continues to stand today. In fact, as Rabbi Helfman mentioned at the beginning, I worked here as the manager of community engagement and although the top two floors were dorms at that time, my office was right here. And it's incredible to see and have personally experienced the bricks and mortar that were created because of these sisterhoods, including our very own here. So I do just want to talk a little bit more about Rebecca Brickner before we move on to Rabbi Isserman. All that to say, after the Brickners left Toronto, they went to uh, Anshe Chesed in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, Mrs. Brickner became the first woman in the United States to conduct an entire temple service and read from the Torah in Hebrew. 
There's even a story, which I'm not sure is true or not, that her husband was once away. And while he was away, she picked the new head of education. Uh, I can assure you that would never happen here. Um, but it's crazy to think that this woman was respected enough and, and had the power and ability to make those kinds of decisions in that community. And lastly, I just find this beautiful. In 1972, Mrs. Brickner received an honorary doctorate uh, from the Cleveland College of Jewish Studies. In 1973, she earned a master's degree. In 1974, HUC, instead of giving her an ordination, gave her a tribute, including a formal religious service. So this woman, Rebecca Brickner, in her own right, was very influential here, as we can see our sisterhood still thrives today and in the United States at HUC Cincinnati. So now we come to the handsome Rabbi Ferdinand Isserman. He was born in 1898 in Belgium and immigrated in 1906. He was pretty young when he came to school. So he had earned his BA from the University of Cincinnati and was ordained at HUC Cincinnati. He also served in World War I, even though because he was in seminary, he didn't, because he had a deferment, he didn't have to, but he chose to. Rabbi Isserman was quite a character. Um, I mean, he's not Isaac Mayer Wise character, but he's up there. So one of the interesting things is that in the 1920s, um, he actually served as the center for the University of Cincinnati basketball team which still exists today and in fact was in the tournament last year, um, as well as served as an important person in his ordination class. So we can see here just kind of the difference between Rabbi Isserman on the court and Rabbi Isserman in the field. Um, so once he came to HUC at the age of 16, he left at 24. There's, there's a story that Michael is gonna tell uh, in a couple minutes uh, about uh, Rabbi Isserman and his times at HUC, but I'll let him tell you that. Um, and so Isserman comes to Cincinnati, or comes to Toronto, having just recently been ordained and coming off of Rabbi Brickner's impression. And so his inaugural sermon, which we were able to find uh, through newsprint, has this quote which I think highlights the difference between his thinking and Brickner's thinking. The rabbi must have a free pulpit and must be free to speak his soul's dreams. It is only a free spirit who can utter a living message. Israel did not go to Sinai to receive beautiful truth until it had been liberated from Egypt. So we can see right away, Isserman is thinking about free speech. He's thinking about, you know, kind of shirking off some of the uh, restrictions. He's not so much thinking about what are the systems and organizations as much as he is, what is the message? Um, so while he's here, he also does an incredible amount. He was only 27 years old when he was appointed to Holy Blossom as the senior rabbi. And he was the first official Canadian Jewish rabbi to exchange a pulpit between Holy Blossom and a Christian minister. It's actually amazing we have documents on it. Um, something else he's really well known for is he led a campaign against corporal punishment in the city's public schools. And he also organized the first Goodwill Dinner among Catholics, Protestants, and Jews in Canadian history. He organized the first interdenominational armistice day in Toronto. He also was a contributing editor to the Canadian Jewish News. And in recognition of all this work, an interfaith prize was established at U of T um, in his name. So it's really fascinating to think that at Holy Blossom, we benefited from having a structural thinker and then an outside thinker who really, really brought interfaith to the forefront. So during his last sermon, which was found at the American Jewish Archives, um, he kind of sums up what he did best. So during my rabbinate here, the liberal Jewish traditions inaugurated in the reign of the late Rabbi Jacobs and continued by Rabbi, Rabbi Brickner have carried on. We have added a Sunday morning service, 
the first of its kind in Canada. We have given women all privileges of membership. We have made the wearing of hats optional at Sunday service. We have broadcast some of our services. We have inaugurated an annex Holy Day service, which has been conducted by our young people. And we have founded the Holy Blossom College of Jewish Studies. I found the fact that um, I had actually read a little earlier about this annex service because Dr. David Eisen, the original founder of the Holy Blossom Archives, wrote this nifty journal when he was a student in med school between 1817 and 1820, and he attended one of those services. So little, little did Rabbi Usserman know, he was aspiring a future archivist uh, during these Holy Day services that would then go on to inspire our archival committee today. Um, so we've been really blessed to have these amazing rabbis that have come before us and these rabbis' wives and and really the commitment from the community to work together in tandem to make sure that Reform Judaism continues to thrive here at Holy Blossom. So I really saw three things that were lasting influences that came from HUC Cincinnati through our rabbis and continue at Holy Blossom. So the first is women in the rabbinate. Uh, rabbi Sally Prezend was the first Reform rabbi ordained in the United States at HUC JIR Cincinnati in 1971. Uh, many of us know now uh, about the female rabbi who was ordained uh, in Europe prior to World War II, uh, Regina Jonas. Um, and she is considered the first ordained female rabbi, although Sally Prezend is the first reformed female rabbi. And then, of course, uh, some of us have been at Holy Blossom long enough to remember this, not me included, but uh, Rabbi Joan Friedman, Canada's first female rabbi, was appointed the assistant rabbi at Holy Blossom here in 1980. And then, of course, our very own Rabbi Yael Swalansky is the first female rabbi to head a major congregation in Toronto. So this, this kind of idea from the beginning uh, has continued, that there, there is a stream here where people are considered full members, no matter what their gender. Another important influence uh, is the interfaith relations. Both Brickner and Isserman worked outside of the Jewish community to continue communication. And uh, just a very quick story. Uh, if, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard my husband teach Abraham Joshua Heschel at some point. Um, but he was originally saved from the Holocaust because he was brought to HUC Cincinnati by the current president. Uh, he didn't love it. Uh, he eventually went to Jewish the Theological Seminary in New York, um, but he was there and he did make quite an impact. And in fact, uh, for those of you that remember Rabbi Dov Marmer, uh, his son, Rabbi Michael Marmer, um, is a bit of a Heschel expert. And this photo actually comes from the cover of the book uh, that he wrote on him. And this is Abraham Joshua Heschel sitting on the steps of HUC Cincinnati. Um, he's most well known for his walk alongside Martin Luther King Jr. in the Selma marches. You can see him here with this incredible beard. Um, and this inspiration to put Jewish values, tikkun olam, into action can be seen still in our rabbis today. And in our classes, it'll be seen through uh, Rabbi Feinberg's efforts against racism, economic injustice, nuclear arms, Vietnam, it goes on and on. But these interfaith relationships and these kind of action steps were inspired originally by some of the work done at HUC Cincinnati. And of course, I would not be doing my job if I did not talk about how important North American Jewish history is. All Jewish history is important, but North American Jewish history is very important. Uh, Jacob Rader Marcus, who was a professor and rabbi at HUC Cincinnati between 1922 and 1995, uh, actually founded the American Jewish Archives in 1947, which still stands today, and is the largest collection of Judaica and Hebraica outside of Israel and the entire world, and it resides as the crown jewel of the Cincinnati campus. Um, and of course, being here at Holy Blossom, it wouldn't be right if we didn't understand our obligation 
and duty to preserve and share and honor this history that we have um, alongside the history of the rest of North American Jewry. And so I'll just leave with one more quote from Jacob Rader Marcus. Um, it's from his instruction manual on how to write the history of an American Jewish community. Um, when you are writing or Zooming, you are not writing, you are writing not only for yourself and your generation, but also for posterity, for the American people. So I hope that maybe it's not for posterity, but maybe just for sheer interest. Um, I, hope, I hope that I accomplished that today. I hope that uh, I shared something that was interesting with you or that you didn't know. And I certainly learned things that I didn't know. Um, and, and so I'd like to open the floor now to, to answer any questions that I can or have Zachary answer any questions that he can. Um, so yeah, did, did anything come up? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I, I just wanted to say something that, that was somewhat personal. Uh, Jack is gonna have, have a good laugh here. Uh, my family's been member, members of Holy Blossom since at least the 20s. My aunt was confirmed by Rabbi Brickner here. And um, I went to camp with Rabbi Balfour Brickner before he was Rabbi Balfour Brickner. And I knew him well. He was absolutely movie star gorgeous. <laughs> and I had a real crush on him. So I've been sort of around for a while. So I just, I wanted to sort of say something because it, it just sort of brought it all home to me with my, with my memories, which I'm dealing with a lot lately. So, and I just thought, Katie, that your, your lecture, your, your leading of this program was absolutely superb. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, thank you. And do me a favor, if you're dealing with these memories, write them down. Because someone like me will... Care, you know, I care and we care and this is history. Like, even if it is just that you went to camp and he was a fox, you know, like those are the details that right. we miss in history. My aunt's picture is still hanging somewhere, Sheila. I don't know where you got them, but her confirmation picture, my aunt from 19, I think it was 23. They still have that picture there. Not to mention mine's there as well from when I was confirmed, but, but uh, it, it, those pictures really go back a long time. And I think at some point we should have an exhibit of them so that all us old members can, can see ourselves again and our, and our ancestors. You know, Sheila, I'm always, I'm always pushing for that. <laughs> yes, I know, Harriet. And the pictures do still reside on the walls of Holy Blossom. Uh, they're in the corridor between the second, third, floor. I keep getting mixed up, whether it's north, south, east, west. But anyway, one of the corridors there, we do have all our confirmation pictures dating right back to the 1920s. Uh, but you know, at any time, Harriet, that uh, we do a program that highlights those confirmation pictures, you and so many others um, tell us how, how much you love seeing them and brings back such wonderful memories that we should share. So yeah, we need to think about what we can do with those pictures. Our, our, co our confirmation in those days really meant a great deal to especially the girls because we didn't have bat mitzvahs, but we did have confirmation. And, and it was absolutely, an, it was an inspiration to us. And Rabbi Feinberg was, was the rabbi at the time. Katie, you, you did a wonderful job. I agree with Harriet. Thank you. <laughs> you wanted me. You wanted Katie. You wanted me to say something about uh, Rabbi. Isserman. Oh, yeah. Will you tell Isserman's uh, HUC? Uh, uh, performance? Well, I read in one of the uh, uh, journals of the American Jewish Archives. I forget what the topic was, but they mentioned that uh, Rabbi Isserman, when he was a student at HUC, was threatened with expulsion because as head of the Students Association, I mean, he's mentioned he had a position in the graduating class, he was, I think, president of the Students Council or something like that. He invited Eugene V. Debs to address the student body. Now, Eugene V. Debs was head of the American Socialist Party, a presidential candidate on a number of occasions. Um, now, this says actually more about Hebrew Union College than it does about Rabbi Isserman. It says about him that he was something of a rebel. And part of our title is rebels. But it says that so we, we think of Hebrew Union College as kind of this bastion of progressive, uh, left-leaning American politics. Uh, it was not always so. 
they were very conservative. And the idea of inviting, of inviting the head of a socialist party uh, to address the student body was beyond the can. And, and he was, I say, threatened with expulsion. Uh, and I think they had to rescind the, the, the invitation. The two other things about Rabbi Isman, while he was here, you mentioned that he, he established the uh, Sunday morning uh, services, or he re recalls that he established. According to. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's true. And of course, they, at, the point, at that point, they abandoned the late Friday night service, which had been, been established by Rabbi Brickner, uh, the late after dinner Friday night service. Uh, but that's very important because it, it became the Sunday morning service became the main venue for the rabbi to speak. And uh, it was employed by Rabbi Isman. And then uh, Howard will talk in a couple of weeks about mm -hmm. Rabbi uh, uh, Rabbi Eisendrath, who used the Sunday morning service to its fullest extent and, and drew in uh, uh, both members of the congregation and members of the, the Jewish and non-Jewish community at large, became a very important part of our, our, of our history. Uh, but I once met uh, someone doing a shiva service and met an older gentleman who said he recalled Rabbi Isman very well. And what he recalled best was that he had, he held a Saturday afternoon Bible study sessions, they didn't call it Torah study, Bible sessions uh, in his home, in Rabbi Essendon's home. Every Saturday afternoon, uh, people would come to his home. I guess there weren't that many of them uh, that uh, he could host them, uh, and they studied Bible together. So he did have that uh, connection to uh, you know, a kind of Shabbat uh, learning activity. Uh, and, and I met a few people who knew him and described him as a very warm, kindly, kindly gentleman. Oh, and the other thing is, you mentioned he was in the First World War. Uh, he left, he went from, he went from uh, Toronto to St. Louis, uh, where, by the way, he was Rabbi Moskowitz's childhood. Uh, he wasn't his childhood rabbi. He had retired by that time. He was a rabbi emeritus. But Rabbi Moskowitz remembers him sitting on the pulpit as a kind of elderly gentleman. Uh -huh. But during the Second World War, he left that congregation. He took a leave of absence to serve with the American Red Cross overseas uh, uh, dur during the, the, the war. So we actually saw action. In the world yeah, I, I, I find it fascinating that these, that these people, and I'm married to one, so I know they're three-dimensional, mm -hmm. but it's fascinating to me that these rabbis had these full lives and commitments outside of the pulpit that really informed who they became. Um, and, and I see in our chat quotes, actually, Zachary has uh, a really interesting tidbit to share. Um, if he's still listening, but you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It's so funny, as, uh, as time goes on, I feel like I'm getting worse at Zoom. Um, <laughs> you're doing it a so, little bit more than the rest of us, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I don't pretend to be busier than anyone else. Um, but, yes, Perry Nussbaum, you mentioned. Um, and so Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, um, I could speak about him forever, so I, I, don't, I, won't, I won't talk about him too much, but I did see, say in the chat that he was a, really a major player in the American uh, civil rights movement. Um, this was, he was known, uh, best known um, for traveling between his home in Jackson, Mississippi, um, all around the South to different uh, jails. Um, at the time when people were being jailed for voter registration, um, people who were held in jail did not have access to the mail. Um, they could get letters, but they had to be hand delivered. And so what uh, Perry Nussbaum did on his own um, dollar was he had people send, um, you know, family members, uh, anyone who was in the South within a six hour drive of him, he would have family members send letters and then he would go hand deliver the letters to people in jails in the jail sales he would sit at the jail uh, the whole day collect all of the letters that the prisoners had written and then go back home and send them on to their families um, and this was actually a lot of the ways so it's one it's nice to have like the personal connection with family um, but it's also ways in which people were speaking with their lawyers um, and so, yeah, he, he is a, a really big deal. And, and uh, as you see, he um, became a well-known enough figure speaking out against uh, 
you know, social uh, racial injustice in Jackson, Mississippi in the 60s, um, his, he became a target and his home uh, was the target of a bomb uh, and his synagogue as well. Both his home and his synagogue within, with, within five years of each other were bombed. Uh, and thank God no one was injured. Um, Our friend, any... uh, Rabbi Rosen, is now working there. At yeah. that if you have any reading <clears throat> suggestions that would dig more into that, I'd be into that. If, if you can think of anything, let me know. Um, I can think of stuff, but he's he's a big name. I think if you were to just uh, like if Google I just Google Rabbi him, there's tons of stuff. Harry Nussbaum, you'd probably find some interesting stuff. Cool. Rabbi, uh, maybe Michael Cole would know this. Uh, he, why why was it that uh, Brickner left uh, and Nussbaum as well? I mean, yeah, I mean, Toronto was probably a backwater then, but to go to Cleveland, I mean, oh. <laughs> Cleveland's worse. I know. What 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 uh, what prompted that? Do you have any idea, Michael? Well, Cleveland was had some some. Uh, uh, I mean, you're right. Uh, Cleveland compared to Toronto in those th that time was was big. Buffalo was was big, mm -hmm. uh, but Cleveland uh, had a couple of big synagogues. Uh, one of them was Abba Hillel Silver's synagogue, and he was a big yeah. rabbi. Uh, you know, lead, one of the leaders of the, the American Zionists and so on, it was called The Temple. Um, and uh, uh, it had another name, it had a real name, but everyone knew it as The Temple. And uh, Rabbi Brickner's congregation was Euclid Avenue uh, Synagogue, which, and then they moved and became the Fairmont Synagogue. Uh, and these were, these were big congregations, and, and it was a step up. Um, and uh, you're right, at some point you couldn't step up any further than Holy Blossom, uh, but, uh, but not in those days. In those days you, 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 you certainly could. I can tell another story about Rabbi Brickner actually that, that's kind of amusing if it's time. If anyone wants to say anything, I'll defer because uh, I don't want to use up all the time. But um, he was in Cleveland and I, at, at, at one point I, I knew someone, in, in, I was in London, Ontario and I had a local girlfriend whose father uh, remembered Rabbi Brickner coming to London during the Second World War uh, to uh, raise funds for something, I forget what, some Jewish cause. And uh, my friend's father was dispatched, he was a young man at the time, to uh, pick him up at the, at the train station, he came in by train. So he goes question. to the train station and picks up Rabbi Brickner, who immediately says to him, uh, and goes, reaches in his pocket and picks out a, a, a $10 bill or whatever and says, young man, I want you to go to a liquor store and buy me the best scotch you can find. Um, and he's a little taken aback, but he, you know, first takes the rabbi to the hotel and then goes to find this bottle of the best scotch that he can find. And I guess he buys a fifth or something takes it back to the hotel and watches as Rabbi Brickner proceeds to down it. And uh, he, he drank the whole thing. And then he was to take him to where he was delivering this speech. And I said, well, was the rabbi coherent? Was he lucid? Could he stand up? And he looked at me seriously and said, it was the best speech he has ever heard. He was not only lucid, he was eloquent and, and forceful and right on and, and, and raised whatever money he could. Now I know why he so, left. Uh, uh, Rabbi Goodman, if you want some, a tip on how to deliver you know, uh, sermons. Uh, uh, Michael, when was Prohibition take, over? Take a hint from Rabbi, Rabbi Brickner. Michael, when did Prohibition end? In Canada? No, in the United States. 1934. When? 1934, after the election of uh, uh, Roosevelt. When did Brickner... It was much more complicated. According when? to Rabbi Spolansky, uh, Rebecca Brickner had something to do with them coming to Toronto. So I can't, I can't confirm that she probably had something with them moving to Cleveland. Uh -huh. uh, but it would be interesting to see if her influence was also there. Like maybe it was possible that there was a job as her as the head of education or something. That also made the move. Besides the booze, um, there might be another reason. 
Well, so I was wondering how, if we know, Katie or our cause team, if we know, how did we get these rebel rabbis? Was it just like coincidence and we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into? Did we seek out really sort of like strong, different thinkers? So Rabbi Brickner was the first student of Hebrew Union College to come up, which means he was the first traditionally trained reform rabbi. So just by virtue of being in a slightly different stream of Judaism, he was going to be considered a rebel. Um, but also we got like the cream of the crop. I mean, the people that came to Toronto, much like today, um, are like really, okay, sorry, Zachary, um, are really incredible um, and have a lot of potential. And so um, like Rabbi Feinberg, which you'll talk about, you know, like, some of these things that the people did that are so uh, impactful didn't happen until after they left. Um, but we, we basically were in a transition time between orthodoxy and having some of the old guard uh, pass away or move on. And Sheila will definitely highlight this. I was just going to say that. Yeah, next, so, so stay, I will- Stay tuned next week, Emily. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I won't say anymore, I'm going to tell you all about it. <laughs> Katie, uh, what, uh, do you know, I, I have the impression that Dr. Marcus was for many years a kind of one-man placement committee. Um, would he have had anything to do uh, uh, at that time with, with, with the rabbis that were that came to Canada? Uh, no, because he wasn't ordained until 1922, which means he was a classmate and peer of Brickner and Isserman. But I can assure you that pretty much between the 40s and the early 2000s, uh, Jacob Rader Marcus held incredible power in shifting students and rabbis and clergy around North America. So I'm going to jump in and say that I hope this is a uh, great teaser of uh not sorry i hope this this conversation we're having now is a great teaser but that the whole thing uh, was not a teaser but a but a full meal over over lunch uh thank you katie for uh teaching inspiring and uh we've learned about fist fights and drinking and the, the real <laughs> things that make the reform movement uh, go around um coming up next as you can see um is uh our own sheila smolkin um all the people here are our own but, but especially our own Sheila Smokin, um, who will be uh, bringing us to the fascinating period of uh, Edmund Scheuer, who actually it's some overlapping period, um, and the coming of reform here to, uh, to the Holy Blossom, to Canada. Um, so thank you, Judy, and- Marvelous. Thank you very much. Nice work, thanks, Katie. Marvelous.